This is episode 6 of Amos chapter 4. So here's Amos preaching to the northern kingdom. This is the northern kingdom, and then it goes into Assyrian captivity, and the southern kingdom goes into Babylonian captivity. Amos was active circa 760 to 753 BC, just seven years in total. He preached during the rule of King Uzziah of Judah, which is a bit here, who reigned for 52 years, and Jeroboam II of Israel, over here, who reigned for 41 years. So the northern kingdom is also called Israel, it's also called Ephraim. Sometimes called Jacob even. So the reigns of the two kings overlapped about 15 years. The north and south were at the zenith of their power. They both experienced national stability, prosperity, and the expansion of their kingdoms. This is a recap of chapter 1, um, Punishment of Israel's Enemies. Here's a recap of the same for Punishment of Their Cousins. You can pause and read this if you want to, or we'll continue. So recap of chapter 2, Judgment on Judah and on Israel. And recap of chapter 3, A Prophet's Authority. And you can pause this and reread if you want to, otherwise we'll continue. So the layout of Amos illustrates his key idea, judgment comes. So we've done chapters 1, 2, and 3. And now we're on chapter 4, Israel's past, what God did in the past to Israel. God's punishments have not reformed Israel. Israel did not accept correction. So here we are here, Israel's present, past, and future. We're on their past. So let's dive into chapter 4, prepare to meet your God. So chapter 3 was focused on the sons of Israel, and chapter 4 is directed at the women of Samaria and the people of Israel. So God's punishments have not performed Israel. Verse 1, hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. Hear this word. God's focus is on Israel's social injustices, and he wants them to pay attention. Bashan. Bashan was east of the River Jordan and extended for miles. It was famous for its lush pastures, watered by mountain springs, and its well-fed livestock. So here is the, the Jordan River, and here's Bashan. It was Reuben, Gad, and half of the tribe of Manasseh took this area. In Numbers 52, when the Israelites were fighting against the Canaanites, Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh saw this region was good for raising cattle and asked that it be allotted to them. They settled their wives and families there. Then the men crossed the river Jordan with Joshua to continue to fight for the promised land. And so here's the other half of Manasseh. So Manasseh took some of Bashan and some of the site. You cows of Bashan. Amos has total disdain for high society. Cows is a derogatory term for the spoiled woman living in luxury. They are compared to the best breed of cattle in ancient Canaan which was raised and pampered in the pastures of Transjordan. These women had all descended to an animal level, heartless and callous, solely focused on gratifying their immediate brainless appetites. They were living above their incomes and had no respect for their husbands and lorded over them. Bring wine, let us drink. By keeping up with the Joneses, these domineering women forced their overly indulgent men into a mercenary rat race, demanding excessive luxuries, which were accumulated at, at the expense of the oppressed, poor, and needy. Amos has no time for these cows of Bashan, as he calls them, and their drunken lifestyle. They are the number one culprits for driving the poor deeper into poverty. Some scholars suggest that their body living might also imply homosexuality, sodomy, and lesbianism among the wealthy and the rulers as God allowed them to wallow in their debased ways. Verse 2, The Lord God has sworn by his holiness, Behold, the day shall come upon you, when he will take you away with fishhooks, and your posterity with fishhooks. The Lord God has sworn. This stresses the solemnity of Amos' prophecy, and the certainty of it coming to pass. Sworn by his holiness. Sworn by his holiness. His holiness is a contrast, to Israel's sin, and a reminder that they broke their side of the Mosaic Covenant, whereas God did not. These haughty women will be dragged away by the Assyrians using fishhooks, and it will come to pass. 
because the Lord God has sworn. Take you away with fish hooks. The practice of fish hooks was widely used in ancient times to subdue and lead slaves. The Assyrians led their captives with a hook through their nose or lips. A string was tied to the hook and then attached to a rope held by an Assyrian that led them, all tied together, one behind the other. 2 Chronicles 33 Therefore the Lord God brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. Don't forget Samaria was the capital of Israel, and it was in the region of Manasseh. Habakkuk 1 They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net and gather them in their dragnet. The callous citizens of the land, these proud, spoiled women, were led away like animals. The ultimate humiliation. Your posterity with fish hooks. Overnight they went from indulgent and rich to utterly ruined and penniless. They were reduced to the same state as the poor that they crushed. And history, posterity, remembers the North with shame and disgust. Verse 3. You will go out through broken walls, each one straight ahead of her, and you will be cast into harm, and says the Lord. You will go out to broken walls. The Assyrians utterly smashed the fortifications of Samaria and broke multiple holes in her walls. The citizens of Samaria were led through the breaches into captivity. And look at these walls. They're like 10 stories high and 20 feet wide. I mean, look at the size of the people on them relative to the size of the wall. And yet the Assyrians smashed their walls and fortifications. Cast into Harman. Harman may be a place, but otherwise it's unknown. It's likely a place of exile or disgrace, a place where people were cast or tossed away, like refuse. Verse 4. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes every three days. Now Amos' tone changes and is directed more generally at the people and is even more scathing. Bethel. So Bethel is here in the land allotment of Ephraim. Bethel, which means house of God, was 11 miles north of Jerusalem and a city of great importance. It was a major north-south trading center and its main east-west route was from Jericho to the Mediterranean Sea. Only Jerusalem is mentioned more frequently than Bethel in the Old Testament. Bethel was a place where God's help was commemorated with sacred altars. So you can see if trade was going north-south, it went through Bethel. If it was going east-west, Bethel was a trading post. So Genesis 12, Abram, later renamed Abraham, pitched his tent there at Bethel, built an altar to God and called upon the name of Yahweh. Genesis 28, Jacob dreamed of his ladder there with the angels ascending and descending and gave Bethel its name. Genesis 28 later, then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of the city had been Luz previously. Come to Bethel and transgress. Bethel had been a holy place, but now Amos is being sarcastic. Bethel was the site of King Jeroboam's golden calf, the core of the new king's man-made false religion. Many Israelites failed to understand or chose to ignore the fact that the worship of the golden calf was idolatry, a major transgression. To transgress means to break a covenant. To transgress means to break a covenant, and these people were happily following unbiblical cults. Bezel had become a place of abysmal apostasy, flaunting their idolatry in the face of the one true God. At Gilgal. Gilgal was the first stop of the Israelite army under Joshua after they crossed the river Jordan. They built an altar and encamped there in preparation for taking Jericho. It was a popular place of worship in Amos' day. Saul was anointed as king there by the prophet Samuel in Gilgal. It was an important place. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. It appears that Gilgal had also become a site for idolatry. Dan was the other site of the golden calf, but it's not mentioned. I don't know why. But with Bethel, this makes three major idol worshipping sites. Amos is sarcastically inviting the people to come to these sites and commit idolatry. In fact, commit even more crimes. Multiply your sins. Bring your sacrifices, your tithes. 
Amos is disgusted. Have an orgy. Use your ties to finance your unholy religion with its selected and elected priest. In these wealthy societies, religion flourished, but not godliness. The worship sites had become an affront to God, and their bogus altars were illegitimate. There were two priesthoods in existence at the time, but only the priests of Judah were legitimate and anointed and practiced in the temple of Jerusalem. The other, the priests of the north, were selected and elected. They were illegitimate. So, the unanointed priests of the north practiced in three unholy temples in Bethel, Gilgal, and Dan. This led to the three main eyes that God hates. Idolatry, immorality, and injustice, the three basic sins in the Bible. Amos mocks the people to continue with their man-made rituals that they feel so good about, but no amount of rituals and tithing would replace ethical and godly behavior. And it's amazing that God put them in this order because this is the order that we fall in, so, you know, that we fall from grace. So the Ten Commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols for yourself, and you will not use the na name of God in vain. You won't say you're they won't like the North where they say they're godly, but in fact are apostates. And remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. So the first four, God says, I'm a holy God. Treat me that way. And if you don't, it's idolatry. That's the first thing that you fall into is idolatry. And, of course, we have all our modern idols, money, bigger yacht, bigger car, three homes. And then what, what happens next is immorality because we start to cover. The Ten Commandments is don't cover your neighbor's wife and donkey and stuff. But of course we do. We also want a big yacht and a fancy, fancy house. And so we start to cover. Pretty soon we're in a state of immorality because now we are sleeping with the neighbor's wife that we coveted. And then we just, it's from there to downward slide and race to the bottom. It becomes injustice. People start lying and stealing. It's just a little lie. It's not a real lie. It's a white lie. They still, it's not a lot, it's not a bank robbery, it's just a little stealing. And so we break all ten commandments and it goes in this order. It's amazing, isn't it? God put them in that order and that's the order that we, we fall in. So today, pastors are always talking about hell and then condemnation in case you take your tithes elsewhere. And these pastors have very expensive lifestyles to maintain. Some of our mega churches are precisely in this situation. The people come to church on Sundays where they listen to a short motivational speech by a godless pastor. But Monday to Saturday, they live their lives as though there's no God watching. Their tithes and offerings feed their pride and smug self-righteousness. Look at me. My tithes support the church and missionaries worldwide, and my offerings support a black family in Ghana. When I was unsafe, I would point out to my mom that I still and always had paid my tithes. From my very first salary, I paid my tithes. My mom's response was, so you think your tithes are like an insurance premium that will get you through the pearly gates? No, you only pay tithes to solve your conscience because you never go to church. You hope your tithes will count for something in the hereafter. But they don't and they won't. My Pentecostal mother always knew how to prick my self-righteous balloon. It's only one way to meet God. That's unconditional surrender and accepting the gift of salvation through his son Jesus Christ. So grateful that now I am saved. I accepted that gift. Verse 5. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Proclaim and announce the free will offerings. For this you love, you children of Israel, says the Lord God. A sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. So the burning of leavened bread is in the sacrifice was strictly forbidden. This would be an inappropriate gift to the Lord. Leviticus 6, the grain offering, it shall not be baked with leaven. Why? Because leaven represented sin in the Bible. However, there were offerings given with leaven as acknowledgement of our own personal unworthiness. Leviticus 7. If he offers it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer. Now notice a thanksgiving, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. If he offers it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with a sacrifice of thanksgiving and leaven cake mixed with oil unleavened wafers anointed with oil. So this to sac uh, sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven was a very inappropriate gift to the Lord. There's the voluntary offering, the burnt offering, the peace offering, and the meat the cereal offering, and of course the obligatory offering, the sin offering, and the trespass offering. And these ones they gave a miss because they didn't want to acknowledge their own sin, but they liked those, the other ones. 
So Israel's thanksgiving offerings stifled their conscience. It's interesting that Amos doesn't bother to remind the north to bring sin offerings because they are definitely not looking at atonement for their sins. Proclaim and announce the free will offerings. Proclaim and announce the free will. Brag. Brag in public about your generosity, your pious giving to the less fortunate. Arms for the poor. For this you love. Their man-made religion boosted their egos, made them feel good about themselves. Sacrifice time was fun, a boisterous social occasion. It wasn't meant to be a downer where you admitted your sinful ways. They sincerely loved their superficial rituals, but they were sincerely wrong. Israel did not accept correction and get seven punishments in return. <clears throat> God challenges the North. He kept challenging their wealth by eroding it. He kept sending crisis after crisis, but still they didn't repent. These punishments are not natural disasters. They are deliberate acts of God. God typically used natural disasters to discipline his people, but they soon forgot the lesson and averted to past behavior. These crises had previously happened in Israel's past. So we're going to go through a list of all the punishments that had happened in the past. So here's God's bounty that he provides us with. I mean, you, you're walking with God, he gives you a bounty for life. So the first punishment, famine. Verse 6. Also I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities and lack of bread in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Cleanness of teeth. This was an ancient idiom meaning they had no food. In the Middle East at that time, they didn't use toothbrushes. A healthy sign was that food was lodged in your teeth. But God sent a drought, causing massive crop failures. The people were enduring an awful famine. There was no food to get stuck in their teeth. Because the Northern Kingdom broke the Mosaic Covenant that they swore to keep at Mount Sinai, now they face the judgment of God. God never breaks his own covenant. When he judges, it's always strictly according to the covenant the law of Moses that he laid down. And his current judgment is a famine. So if they were living according to godly ways, that's what they would get. But this is what they get instead. Famine, millions of people dying of lack of food. Lack of bread in all your places. Bread was a staple diet of the Hebrews. Not only will they not have luxury, they won't even have their staple food to eat and nowhere to buy food. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. A ghastly famine, but they don't turn to God for help. The provider of all provisions. Warning number one. With a fire plus two judgments comes five cries of grief from God. You have not returned to me. It always stuns me that insignificant, puny humans have the ability to deeply wound Almighty God, the creator of all heaven and everything in it and all of earth and everything in it, and us humans. He created us all, yet we can wound him, upset him, make him angry, hurt his feelings. I weep when I think of this incredible almighty creator being grieved by his family, by us, by me. Today, as always, God is calling us back to him. God does not judge a nation without first warning us and calling to us over and over. But do we listen? No. Typically, just a tiny remnant pays attention. And I put this picture in over weeping angels because Jesus said that when one person is saved, the tumult in heaven is huge. The angels are singing and glorifying God and, and blowing trumpets and you know, hallelujahs. And so there's this huge racket in heaven because one person got saved. And I'm wondering if when a nation falls, angels weep. Instead of singing. So punishment number one was famine. Punishment number two is drought. Verse seven. I also withheld rain from you. When there were still three months to the harvest, I made it rain on one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, that part withered. Withheld rain. The harvest season starts with barley and a few weeks later with wheat. During March, April, which is spring in the Mediterranean, the crops are ripening and rain is crucial to their success. No rain is a disaster because the grain cannot fully develop and the crop yields will be small, causing great hardship on the population. In addition, the animals will suffer and die from a lack of hay or barley. So 
So no meat to eat, no milk to drink, no water, and no next generation of baby calves or sheep or kids. Deuteronomy 28. They now, because of their sin, they're operating under God's curses as listed in Deuteronomy 28. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. The Lord will send on you cursing, confusion, and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly because of the wickedness of your doings in which you have forsaken me. The double problem, the wickedness of their doings, and they've walked away from God. Only a century earlier, in Israel's past, Elijah told the king that no rain would fall on the northern kingdom until he said so. 1 Kings 17. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these days except at my word. You'd think the people that Amos was talking to would remember this because it was horrendous. And the horrendous drought lasted three and a half years. This did not endear him to King Ahab and his vicious queen Jezebel. It must have been a truly awful time because Elijah's drought was mentioned by both Jesus and James. Luke 4, but I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah. When the heaven was shut up three years and six months, there was a great famine throughout all the land. And you know, the tragedy is being becoming in those days was becoming a widow where your husband died and couldn't provide for you. And even worse, if your sons died as well. So if you lost your husband and your sons, you were destitute. There was no way to provide for yourself. James 5. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. Three and a half years. So it's repetitive. Drought is also one of the many abilities of two witnesses in Jerusalem at the end of days. Water will be a precious commodity. And even today, wealthy, greedy people are trying to control water. Revelation 11. These have power. This is the two witnesses. These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they will have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. The two witnesses will prophesy for three and a half years. Then they will be murdered and their dead bodies will lay in the street for three and a half days. Over and over, this number appears. God is such a precise God. Rain on one city, I withheld rain from another city. God is admitting he is doing this deliberately as a warning to the north to get their attention. This frustrated the people because the rain pattern was so random that the people had to wander around looking for puddles or pools of water. Verse 8, so two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Two or three. So two or three in the Bible symbolizes a few, a couple, or several. Two or three is not to be taken literally, as though it was less than three cities that were dry. It means some cities were dry, but not all of them. Two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water. The drought is so bad. That whole cities of thirsty peoples wander from place to place, searching for water. Their cisterns and wells had run dry, leaving them without drinking water. While we can go weeks without food, we can only last about three days without water. And babies and toddlers can die within day or half a day without liquid. For the catastrophe of a drought. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. But did they turn to God for help, the creator of all waters? No. Verse 6, they had a warning about famine, and now they have a warning about drought. Look at, this. Look at what earth looks like when we get rain. Isn't that gorgeous? Punishment, number one, was famine, and then drought. Now we get blight and locust. Verse 9, I blasted you with blight and mildew. When your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees, the locusts devoured them. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I blasted you. The crops were blasted by the scorching hot east wind coming off the desert, drying them further in the already enduring drought. With blight, God sent disease and pestilence on their food crop as a direct consequence of pestilence. Deuteronomy 28. They are living under, because of their sin, they are living under God's curses. 
The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning fever and with the sword, with scorching and with mildew. They shall pursue you until you perish. And mildew. Some areas received rains and others didn't, so there was likely some humidity in places that rotted the already decaying crops. The mildew was from the extreme drought, overly stressing the crops, not from excessive moisture. Once the crops have missed a number of waterings, it's very difficult to catch up on water. Even if the Old Testament farmers are doing all the right things agriculturally, since they're in a severe drought, the crops have no chance. Because they breached their Mosaic covenant with God, the Israelites are experiencing the curses of God. Your gardens, vineyards, fig trees, olive trees, nothing was spared. The harvest of their fruit trees and vegetable gardens, all gone. The locusts devoured them. Locusts eat only the green things, so whatever meager harvest remained, the locusts ate. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord, but they didn't return to God for help. The creator of all creatures, great and small, and all fruits and vegetables. Punishment 5, Plague and War. Verse 10, I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men are killed with a sword along with your captive horses. I made the stench of your camps come up into your nostrils. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Plague after the manner of Egypt. Scholars postulate that this was a venereal disease visited on the men of Israel. But others say this was the plague of continual warfare. The Bible is clearer on God's judgment of plague. Deuteronomy 28, the Lord will make the plague cling to you until he has consumed you from the land which you are going to possess. The Lord will strike you with consumption, with fever, with inflammation, with severe burning fever. Your young men are killed with a sword. God says, because of your sin, I caused you to go to war where your young men were slain. But while men beg God to help in wartime, Thereafter, no long-lasting gratitude nor repentance was forthcoming. It was just for the duration of the war. Like the New York Twin Towers that were brought down on September 11th, suddenly the churches were filled to the brim with people searching for God. But after a few months, they all drifted away again. There's no long-lasting change of heart, along with your captive horses. So the early Israelites did not have a cavalry. Other nations rode horses, but the finest cavalry that the Israelites had was under King Solomon with his pride and joy. He had thousands of chariots and horses. God destroyed their proud cavalry. I made the stench of your camps. The implication is that so many men died under the sword that the stench of the dead rose from their camps. You know, this looks such a harmless weapon, but the Benjamites were extremely adept with the sling. And when they threw it, they could throw it two, three hundred yards. And when that stone hit a person, it smashed through their head. The Benjamites were known, the tribe of Benjamin was known for their use of the sling. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. They don't turn to God for help in war. He's the healer of all the plagues and the protector in all wars. So they're getting major warnings. They've had four already. Now they're heading into total destruction. Verse 11, I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. The northern kingdom often had volcanic eruptions, and God sent more of them. The two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are used as an example, not to indicate the manner in which they were overthrown, but the thoroughness with which it was done. The two cities ceased to exist forevermore. The threat is that the northern kingdom would cease to exist forever. A firebrand plucked from the burning. A stick of wood in a fire will be burned to ashes unless someone pulls it out. The implication is that Israel was flirting with imminent and complete destruction unless there was an intervention, like overwhelming repentance. Only God's grace could save them. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord, there this morning. God has sent a variety of disasters of limited scope to wake up the north, but they didn't work. They were too preoccupied with their depraved greed, their criminal behavior, and their debauched paganism. 
Their hearts were hardened and too callous to obey his word. Now they must face the coming consequence. The ultimate terror prepared to meet your God. What was wrong with Israel, basically? They had expanded their borders. They had a mighty army. They had peace. They had prosperity. They even had religion. But they didn't have God. And nothing God tried had resulted in any meaningful repentance. No real change of heart. So Amos says, get ready to meet your God. Amos didn't say, prepare to meet your enemies. Prepare to meet the destruction of the Assyrian Empire. He said instead, prepare to meet your God. These listed disasters of the past have built to a crescendo, but nothing compares to the coming catastrophe. Repentance is no longer an option. The door to deliverance is closed. All that remains is judgment. Verse 12. Therefore thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Therefore, thus will I do to you. This statement is more terrifying because the event itself is not fully disclosed. God used natural disasters in the past to wake up Israel, but now God himself will deal directly with Israel. The sophisticated north had been fattening themselves for the slaughter. In 722 BC, the Assyrians, tempted by the wealthy northern kingdom, swooped down, demolished their fortifications, destroyed their cities, removed their treasures, and marched the entire nation into captivity. They were distributed among the peoples of the Assyrian Empire and settled in other captive lands. The northern kingdom ceased to exist as a unique entity. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. Some were slain, some were ritually tortured, some were left behind as a pathetic, sickly remnant. The vast majority were enslaved. God's judgment is so terrifying that none can mistake it. Devastated Israel was brought to her knees by the Assyrians. How the mighty have fallen. You know, when you have city walls like this, you think you're impervious. Verse 13. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind who declares to man what his thought is and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth. The Lord God of hosts is his name. He who forms mountains and creates the wind. God is not only the almighty creator of heaven and earth. He created us, humanity. He knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts. We can't make excuses. We can't fake it with God. We can't run away from a God that walks the tops of mountains. Every one of us must prepare to meet our maker someday. The fact that someone doesn't believe in God doesn't mean they won't face God and stand before his great white throne on judgment day. Not believing doesn't somehow negate God. We will all face him. And when God sends calamity after calamity on our nations, we should be doing some serious soul searching. We declare to man what his thought is. And God loves to walk with us and talk with us and share his thoughts with us. God wants us in communion with him. He is infused in our very DNA. We are hard-coded to worship him. God is omnipotent, the most powerful. There is no most of powerful. He is it. It is the only the most powerful. God is omnipotent. He's omniscient. He's everywhere and omnipresent. He knows everything. God is able, and he has, and he will judge sin. Everywhere, everything, everyone, at all times, even the dead, report to him. Secret sin on the earth that you think nobody knows about? It's an open scandal in heaven. Billions of angels know what you did in the dark behind the door. The Lord God of hosts. This term is used 282 times in the Old Testament meaning God is at the head of his angelic armies. A God this powerful, with such majesty, is easily able to execute any judgment announced through his prophet Amos. I'm sure you know that the Israeli Defense Force acronym is IDF. The Hebrew acronym is Tahal, which stands for the Host of Defense for Israel. 
Isn't that a lovely, the Hebrew name, lovely? I mean, you just see all these angels hovering over Israel, ready to save them. So that's the end of episode 6, chapter 4, Prepare to Meet Your God. So prepare to meet your God, salvation. John 14, 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Believe on Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Shalom. Please follow me to chapter 5.